A Treatise of Satan's Temptations, Part 2 By Richard Gilpin A Discourse of the Malice, Power, Cruelty and Diligence of Satan Chapter 7, Part 4 Of the Second Way to Hinder Peace Affrightments, the general nature and burden of them, in several particulars. What are the ways by which he affrights? And more. All these do suffer by these violent incursions of Satan, and the sufferer finds himself to be pained and tortured, in these noble parts. How grievous must it be to a child of God to have his ear chained, to these intolerable and grateful reproaches. Especially when we consider that the devil will, in this case utter the most dreadful blasphemies he can devise, which will still add to the affliction. For even those men that through habit can well bear ordinary petty oaths, will yet startle at outrageous prodigious swearing, and therefore whatever covert and consequential blasphemies may be to some men, these impudent, hideous abuses of the holy and just God, must needs sadly trouble those that are forced to hear them. And the more constant the greater trouble. Who would not be weary of their lives, that must be forced to undergo this vexation still without intermission? And yet the devil can advance the trouble a little higher, by the apparatus, or artificial dread, which he puts upon the temptation in the manner of the injection. As the roaring of the lion increaseth terror in the beasts of the field, who without that would tremble at his presence. And as the thundering and lightning at the giving of the law increased the fear of Israel, so when Satan is upon this design, he shakes as it were the house, and makes a noise that the fright may be increased. 3. Suspicious fears of being excluded out of God's eternal decree of election, is another of his affrightments. This is when Satan boldly takes upon him, to determine God's secret counsel concerning any man peremptorily asserting that he is none of God's elect. In which case he often doth only inject the suspicion confidently, without offer of proof. Or if he use arguments, they never amount to a proof of his assertion. Neither is it possible they should, for these are among God's secrets, and out of Satan's reach, though possibly, they may prove the person to be not converted at present. So that this kind of trouble differs exceedingly from those disquiets of temptation, which frequently men suffer about their state of regeneration. And indeed the question should not be confounded, it being of great concern to men when their peace is assaulted, to be able to observe the difference betwixt these two assertions, thou art not elected, and thou art not yet regenerated. Seeing, the latter being granted, there yet remains a hope of the probability, or possibility of that man's conversion afterwards. The suspicions of non-conversion are more common, and not so dangerous. Nay, in non-regenerate persons the fears of their being yet in that condition, being joined with diligence and care to avoid the danger, are necessary and advantageous. But the former being granted, all hopes are, together with that concession, laid off, which must needs make the affrightment intolerable. In this we may observe. 1. That Satan, for the better management of this design, doth not only inject these suspicions in the most dreadful language as, Thou art a lost and damned wretch, hopelessly miserable to all eternity. God hath not elected thee to life, but prepared for thee as a vessel of wrath, the lake of fire and brimstone forever, etc. But also he doth assert them with the highest peremptoriness imaginable, as if he had authority from God to pronounce a sentence of condemnation against a man. This must needs amaze the afflicted unspeakably. 2. In this he also observes his advantages. For there are some men so sadly suited to this design, that Satan comes better to speed upon them than others. Usually he fixeth his eyes. First, upon young persons at their first serious attendances upon, and considerations of, scripture truths. Their hearts are then tender. Youth hath a natural tender-heartedness. We find them coupled together in Rehoboam's character, 2 Chronicles 13 7, when Rehoboam was young and tender-hearted. And they are apt to receive strong impressions. When those who were formerly mindless of their spiritual concern begin to be serious, they can no sooner fall upon a consideration of those weighty doctrines, that there are sheep and goats some saved and some damned, that the blessed are few in comparison of the many, that take the broad way to destruction, and that these were from eternity ordained unto life, and these only, etc. No sooner, I say, begin they to ponder these things, but Satan is ready with his suspicion, and what dost thou know but thou art one of these excluded wretches? If but few are saved, a thousand to one thou art none of them, for why should God look upon thee more than another? These are his first essays with young men beginning to be serious, in which afterward he proceeds with greater boldness as he seeth occasion. Secondly, he also doth this to persons that are some way quickened to a devotional fear of God and care of their souls, but withal are ignorant, and not able distinctly to apprehend, and orderly to range the doctrines of the scriptures, into a due consistency, with one another. 
their careful fears make them inquire into what God hath said, concerning the everlasting state of men. And before they can be able to digest the principles of religion, Satan sets some truths edgeways against them, which put them into great affrightment. While, through their ignorance, other truths, appointed and declared for the satisfaction of the minds of those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, cannot come into their relief. How startling must the truths of God's election be when they stand forth alone, and are not accompanied with the invitations of the gospel, that promise pardon and acceptance to all that will come in and submit to Christ. Satan usually holds such kind of men to the consideration of those truths, that have the most dismal aspect. And while they are stopped there, they can draw forth no other conclusions than these, that they are in hazard, and, for aught they know, utterly lost. Third, Satan hath also this plot against those that by some grievous iniquity, or long continuance in sin, have highly provoked the Lord. Here he useth arguments from the heinousness of their iniquity, thou art a reprobate, because thou hast committed these great evils, these are marks of damnation, etc. Which arguments, though they be of no value, and no way proving that for which they are brought, yet Satan injecting suspicions, and their own consciences, in the meantime justly accusing, they so sink under their fear, that they suffer Satan to make what conclusion he will, and then they subscribe to it. Fourth, above all, melancholy persons give the devil the greatest advantage to raise affrightments. That distemper naturally fills men with sad thoughts, and is credulous of the worst evil, that can be objected against him that hath it. Of itself, it can create the blackest conceits and saddest surmises, and then believes its own fancy. When Satan strikes in with his humor, fingant crudunk, they are the more confirmed in their suspicions. And the fright is the greater, because they are as incredulous of what is good, if it be told them, as they are apt to believe what is evil, and to believe it, because they fear it, dumb time credit, though no other reason were offered, but much more when Satan, in a prophetic manner, foretells their misery, and assures them they must never be happy. 3. The suspicions which the devil hath by these advantages raised up, he doth endeavor to increase, and to root them deeply, in the minds of them upon whom he hath thus begun. And indeed, by frequent inculcating the same thing, with his continued peremptoriness of asserting the certainty of their non-election, he at last brings up very many to a full persuasion that it is so. And besides other arts that he may have, or exercise in this particular, he commonly practiceth upon men, by perverting the true intentment and use, of the doctrine of election. That there is such a thing as election, and that of a determinate number, are truths undeniable. And the end of their discovery in the gospel is the comfort and confirmation of the converted. Here they may see God's unchangeable love to them, how much they stand engaged for the frannis of grace, and that the foundation of God is sure, etc. For to this purpose doth our Saviour improve these doctrines, John the 17th. 6, 7, 9, 12, 15, 16. But nothing of this is spoken to discourage any man from his endeavors, neither can any man prove that he or any other is excluded out of the decree of election, except in case of the sin against the Holy Ghost. Neither is it possible for the devil to prove any such thing against any man, neither ought any to suppose himself not elect, but on the contrary, if he is willing to forsake sin, and desirous to be reconciled to God, he ought to apprehend a probability that he is elected, because the proffer of Christ is made to all that will receive him. And therefore should men stop their ears against such suggestions, and not dispute that with Satan, but rather hearken to the commands, exhortations, and promises of Scripture, it being most certain that these secret things belong to God, Deuteronomy. 29. 29. And are no man's rule to walk by, seeing revealed things only belong to us, all this the devil perverts, for he endeavors to make election the immediate object of our faith, and our rule to walk by. Thanks.